Good afternoon, everyone. I brought my McDonald's bag, some sustainable food. But before I introduce myself a little further, um, I want to start out with something that has got to do with perception. I have a question for you. Who of you is a smoker? <laughs> wow, no, really? Be honest. Two hands. Well, that's, that's really, really a little people. I think that if I asked this question 20 years ago, there would have been a lot of more hands going up. But things change, and perceptions change. If you look at this, these images, these ads, they are a while ago, and you see doctors and babies even recommend, recommending smoking. Now, this is something that we cannot Im imagine. I bet that we cannot even imagine that the person next to you is smoking now, or in a train, or an airplane. But there was a whole per period that it was normal that we smoked that much. And if you look at the image of smoking now, you see things are different. Smoking is not socially accepted anymore. I wonder how it will go with this. This is now a standard part of our street scene. Way too cheap fast food, unhealthy and not even close to the real price. Probably you've been in Maastricht and you saw all these McDonald's ads. So it's really, it's just our life now. But I think that this will change. This is the image now because of a dominant image. It's because we are used to it and we are brought up with it. But that can change and I'm working on that. My name is Natasha Koyman and I live this life as a sustainability rebel working on inspiring people and organizations to change their vision on food, sustainable food, and our diet. A diet on which plant-based food is much more central than animal-based food. When I came here and I was asked to do this TED talk, two thoughts immediately came to mind. I thought, where to start? Because there's just too much to tell about our food system and the way that we have to change things if we want to go on. The second was, I am asked to come and tell my idea, but actually, it isn't my idea at all. People have been working on this for like ages, over 40 years, I think, but things haven't changed. It seems like only a few people know what our food system is like, what the main problem is, our overconsumption of animal-based products. That is weird. And when I found out about that, that people know, that scientists know, and that government knows, I really got excited, and I thought, I want to work on that, and I want to change that. So what is so shocking about what, what we eat? First of all, did you know that our footprint consists for 34% out of what we eat? So that means that more than one-third is caused by our diet. That is a lot. And the biggest part of that footprint is our animal-based products, our eggs and milk and cheese. And if you look at the lunch of just now, you see that is what our diet is primarily based on these days. And our hunger for meat and other animal-based products is only growing. And so our footprint is too. And that is a Diet that really consumes the world in no time. Because, in short, the animal is a very inefficient intermediary. We feed animals so we can eat them, but first they need a whole lot of stuff, like land, water, fertilizers to grow their feed, crops, tra transportation and distribution. But what if we leave out that animal as an intermediary? which leaves us all the land of which we can feed one, no, two, no, even 15 people with the same amount of land as we can feed one person with meat. Now that is a bit a difference. Let me explain you this with burgers. This is a quarter pounder. Maybe you have seen the speech of Michael Pollan not so long ago. And he showed that one quarter pounder is good for almost a liter of oil to produce it. So that is a lot. But you can also translate it into vegetarian burgers, burgers made out of plants. One burger is not good for three, 
not four, but seven burgers made out of plants. So that means that the impact of this burger made of meat has the same impact as these burgers made of plants. Now, I think that if you count this into the real price, that we would do our groceries a whole lot different. I think alone this should cause that we change our diet, but there is so much more, like the way that we are producing. We take fertile land and labor from poor countries, so much even that they cannot grow their own food. And we think that is normal, because we want to eat meat. In total, 80% of all arable land in the world we use for animal feed. 80%, that is huge. That means that there's not even a quarter left to grow all other things we eat, stuff that is much healthier. So conclu concluding, while we stuff ourselves with cheap, fatty foods, now facing over a billion people overweight, simultaneously, almost a billion people are undernourished. And in the meanwhile, we are talking about how bad soy is, because forests are de destroyed to grow it, while 76% of all soy serves as animal food. And we are talking about CO2 reduction, while 20%, and some researchers even say 50%, of all greenhouse gas emissions come from the livestock industry, that is more than the transportation sector. And we are talking about biodiversity loss, while excessive use of fertilizers, which we need to, to grow the animal crops, are used more and more as our demand for meat continues. And last but not least, water scarcity. Did you know that this was defined as the number one threat to human survival? And do you know what the number one consumer of fresh water is? Animal feed. Now, I don't know about you, but still here, I get goosebumps when I hear about all these facts, all these things that are caused by what we eat, especially the animal-based products. And I might be crazy, but I walk the street seeing campaigns like this. Save water, take shorter showers. People are saving water by using the save button on their toilets. And that's good and all, but can somebody tell me why I never saw this as a water-saving campaign? Because what is the use of making a campaign for shorter showers if you compare the water usage of one shower to that of one kilogram of beef. That is 55 liters in comparison to 15,000. So that means that if you skip one kilogram of beef, a big steak, maybe with two persons in Holland, that's 272 shower takes, or 32 hours of non-stop showering. I never did that. I really, I'm stunned by all these facts, I still am. And I cannot believe that I did not know this, that people don't know this, that it isn't prime time news or a fixed curriculum in schools. I think it should be. I could not believe that my whole eating this, uh, history, my diet, no, our diet, doesn't make sense if you read all this. We are trying to save, save, save polar bears during day by giving money, while at night, with every, beat of meat, every bite of meat we take, we just are destroying their habitat. So that means that the greatest threat to mankind, in fact, is on our plate. Now, these, these, these things brings all this to a different perspective, namely, by eating more plants, we can save water, energy, CO2, nature, fertile land, just by eating more plants. But it seems like we do not know what to do if we want to make impact. Just go on, on the streets and ask a few people what they can do to combat climate change. You will probably get answers as electric driving or shorter showers, or take the bicycle every now and then. 
I never heard anybody say, skip the cheese at night. And of course, we should all do these things. But just know that it is fighting symptoms if you compare it to eating more plants and less meat. Now, if it's really so that by eating more plants, we can change the world and we can make impact, then why don't we? I think this has got to do with psych psychology as well as economy. As for our culture and emotional reasons, we are stick to what we're used to. We're stick to our habits. And our habits are that we eat meat every day and in every meal. Just look at your lunch of just now or maybe your yesterday dinner. We eat so much even that we need to slaughter 1.2 billion farm animals every week. This is a big, big number. It means that in every week, in one week, we slaughter more animals than the total number of people killed in all wars throughout history. And in the meanwhile, we avoid about thinking if that is ethical righteous. It is a reality too painful to face, I think. So it's no wonder that we don't want to hear or see it and that no one ever says it. But we can change things. Till now, we are telling ourselves we are used to it. We are brought up with it. What else should I eat? And I also was raised with we need meat. And I'm not the only one in this room, I think. But now we know more, and we know that we can do with less perfectly, and even without it if we want to. But culture is hard to change. I've been to France last year, where my parents live, and we went to this fancy restaurant. And I don't know if you ever visited France, but if you look at the menus there, there is no such thing as a dish without fish or meat. So I asked the waiter, almost apologizing for not wanting to eat an animal that night, if he could make something with vegetables. And he looked at me with this wonder in his eyes, and he said yes, because he couldn't do something else. And really, I had this fabulous dinner. It was great. It was the best I had in, in months with all these vegetables. But when the bill came, it wasn't on it. So I asked the waiter why that was, and he said, well, madame, we cannot put a dish without any meat or fish. It's just vegetables. We cannot put it on the bill. And some of you might find this very good, and in a way it is, because it's a cheap dinner. But I couldn't help thinking that the way to change is a bit long. But I know that we can. Just look at the sushi that we eat right now. In the whole town, every town in Holland, I think, there are a lot of all-you-can-eat sushi restaurants, and we love them. While 40 year years ago, we didn't even know what sushi was. And I think <clears throat> that the issue is not if we think that things taste nice. I, it's more that we're not used to it. Like in Cambodia, they eat tarantulas. And in Indonesia, they eat dogs. And what is normal? Holy cow or a steak? Dog or no dog? Unclean pig or bacon? I think the issue is not whether we're carnivores by nature or that it's normal or not, right or wrong. But the issue is what our current consumption does to the world and to our health. And the issue is whether it's ethical or okay that we take so much land from other countries just to grow our feed, namely cheap burgers. The issue is the future, and the question underlying that is how we can feed the world now and in the future. In 2050, we're with 9 billion people, so we have to think about that. But it's not only in our hands or forks. Political and business-wise and economic, it's also an issue that is very sen sensitive. Did you know that in Holland, the biggest income stems from the animal industry? So that means that our economy flourishes by our addiction to animal-based products. I think here's the reason why we are still campaigning for shorter showers and why Al Gore didn't mention meat as an impact factor while well, it was a truth so inconvenient indeed. If companies look beyond horizons, 
they would see that the future holds no growth for the animal industry. Even if it's just because the world is too small for that, we would need three if we're with nine billion people. Maybe they should look better at all the initiatives that are working on this issue. And as an entrepreneur, I see it happening. I see us discovering the rich empire of vegetables and of plants. Just look at the great chefs right now, like Otto Lenghi with his vegetable Bible, or Michael Pollan with his Eater's Manifesto, but also all the meat replacers, the Dutch Wheat Burger, for example. They are taking over Holland and all the restaurants with this manly burger made of seaweed. And we have plenty of seed to grow that in. And do you know the vegetarian butcher? It started in The Hague, and now it's taking over the world with its prize-winning meatballs and chicken. And no, there's not a chicken or a cow involved in that. It's made out of plants. I think these initiatives are walking ahead of our conservative economy. They are setting an example for the giants of the food industry, and they look beyond horizons. It really is a revolution, and it leads to a better system. And it starts with changing perceptions. Like we did so many times before, we acted upon these perceptions. Like we did when we banished slavery, or apartheid, or violence against women and gay. We did it a lot of times. I think there's no reason not to change your diet a bit but these habits that we have. But now, knowing all the advantages like tackling obesity, hunger, feeding the world, climate change, and the best thing is, it's healthier. We eat more minerals, more vitamins with vegetables instead of hormones, antibiotics, fats, and proteins, which we get too much anyway. So I do not really dare to say that the, that the answer is simple, but I tend to, because we can all make a difference, and it will add up. And it's not about a big change in your di daily life, it's just about small steps and an open mind. Really, food is not the problem, it's the solution. And we, at least in the Western countries, can change the world every day, three times a day, a bit. And you don't even need volunteerism, signing petitions, demonstrations. All you need is your fork. So I suggest that we start helping some polar bears this dinner. Thank you.